Welcome back to Statech Research's seminar series on measuring progress and well-being. I am Kelsey O'Connor, one of the organizers. Today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Kristen Cooper, who will discuss developing a national index of well-being. I think there's a bit of an echo. If you could make sure you're muted, please. I think that, uh, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so Christian will speak for approximately 40 minutes and then address questions at the end, at which time please raise your virtual hands or post your questions in the chat. During the presentation, please keep your microphones muted. Uh, and as a last reminder, we are recording the event. Uh, you'll be able to find this and past recordings on the website and our YouTube channel. Uh, now to introduce Dr. Christian Cooper. So she is an associate professor of economics at Gordon College in the Boston, Massachusetts area. Her research interests are in applied microeconomics, including behavioral economics, environmental economics, and consumer behavior. Most pertinent for us today, she is currently a co-investigator on a National Institute of Health supported research team that is developing a methodology for measuring and tracking a national index of well-being. She also studied this topic as a Fulbright uh, US senior scholar at the Universidad de la Laguna in Tenerife, Spain. Um, I'm particularly interested in Kristen's work today. So as many of you know, I believe subject well-being is valuable for summarizing national well-being and measuring progress. Yet current measures of subject well-being have their limitations. So I'm hopeful that this work of uh, Kristen and her colleagues can alleviate some of those concerns and ultimately result in a better measure of progress. So I'm uh, quite hopeful as uh, we were talking about before. So uh, without further ado, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Kristen Cooper. Kristen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey, for that great introduction. And thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, it's a real privilege to get to, to get to speak with you about this topic. Um, I'm working with uh, a great team, Dan Benjamin, Ori Hafitz, Miles Kimball, Janet Zhao. Um, there's um, been other, oh, other co-authors um, and uh, many research assistants at, uh, on this team as well. Um, I see that we have um, Colby Chambers and Dmitry Leksinov, who are two full-time RAs on the team. They're able to join us. Um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't look like, I think Miles might, might be signing on as well. Um, so, it's, yes, it's great to be here. Um, and the title toward a national index of well-being, that is the, the lofty goal. Um, I'm gonna share today uh, uh, an overview of the, of the project and also a deeper dive into the piece that we've been focusing on the most right now, which is um, kind of measuring the quantities in this uh, so-called index of well-being. Um, so, uh, so without further ado, dive in here. All right, so it's a it's an up, uphill climb or a long staircase to represent the process. Um, just just briefly, a bit of um, context about what we're doing and why how we might construct a well-being index. So, what is well-being? Huge question to start out. Um, I know many folks here um, are experts in all kinds of social indicators. So our team is, uh, is economists, and uh, we don't want to be overly narrow, but um, our view of, of well-being is informed by kind of economic view of, of preference, satisfaction, um, and in particular, kind of idealized uh, preference, satisfaction, or idealized choice uh, as, a, as a normative benchmark. So thinking that what people, what makes people best off is uh, whatever it is that they prefer. Uh, coming to be, so I won't dive much into the more into the to the philosophy uh, than that. Oh, I see Chris's note that the audio is not great. Yeah. yeah, I think we're having similar issues to before. So you're louder now, which is good. Um, I don't know if it, if you have to speak closer, lean in a little. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna come into the I'm gonna come in closer. Uh, is that any better? Seems to be working. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, so, so without um, diving much into the philosophy, but just to be aware of of our normative context and to be uh, to be upfront about that. So that's that's the perspective um, we're coming from. And 
Um, of course, we could try to measure this idea of whether people are kind of getting what they want out of life in a lot of different ways. But one thing we could do is uh, just ask them. So self-reported well-being has, uh, I think, a lot of a lot of promise, in, in part because it has the potential to be more comprehensive than a measure that's constructed from, say, market goods or market consumption like GDP. So. I think on, on this call, there's a lot of folks who are um, already sympathetic to this to this uh, uh, to this feature of using a self-reported measure that it's able to to encompass right more more than just what we consume, but um, uh, the value of relationships and belonging of uh, natural goods, natural resources that aren't uh, market based. Um, uh, health, right, and and not just the inputs, but the actual um, experience of of health and well being. So, so this is the promise of it. Um, we also think about tr uh, trying to respect preferences. Uh, the idea that um, we uh, by asking people what they uh, what, how how well they're doing directly, we're letting them um, tell us tell us what's important to them. Uh, the index piece of it, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper to um, deeper into in the in the first set of slides. And I know this is uh, a, a, more of a controversial um, direction to go in. Um, there is certainly something to be said for the simplicity of just having a single question um, or uh, just keeping keeping the the measure disaggregated, right? Having many questions that we leave as a dashboard. But I'll, I'll say a little bit about why why we're using an index. My real focus is going to be on um, the quantities, so kind of the counterpart to the consumption goods in GDP. Right. So with GDP, we're measuring how much TVs people have or how much food pe people are eating. Right. Um, but we're thinking about quantities of um, dimensions of well-being, and those things are not. Uh, it's not obvious that those are as readily comparable. So comparing people's happiness or uh, people's satisfaction with life or um, sense of purpose. Um, so that so the focus today is going to be me the measurement of those goods uh, of, of uh, so to speak. I'll say a little bit about where we're headed next, um, past uh, going up going up the steps, past where we're at now, thinking about um, overlap between these dimensions of life. Uh, so the issue of overlap is easier when it comes to market goods because GDP only counts final goods in production, right? We don't count intermediate goods uh, with uh, with well-being uh, goods. It's uh, it's a trickier case um, because it might be the case, say that that people's subjective health is an input to their overall happiness or their sense of um, sense of satisfaction. Um, it might also be important in its own right. So, um, so the the meaning of these words um, uh, is is something we have to think about. Um, and then the aggregation. So, the title is toward a national well being index. I'm focusing on the personal well being side of things, but I will say a bit about aggregating um, to a national level and certainly um, that is that is the the goal to have something that is um, not to replace GDP but something that's on par in terms of being uh, rig rigorous in terms of its theoretical foundation and methodology and um, something that can be um, can be compared and, and looked at over time so that is the goal all right so so the so the motivation um, very, very broadly speaking, is just to think about well-being um, comparisons, right? So we're thinking, are people getting better off? Is a policy going to make um, a group of people better off? Um, how do nations compare? Um, and, and, and looking over time, right, is, is, uh, is a nation getting better off? And uh, so, this, so there's this question of comparison. So I alluded to this already, but um, our, our normative benchmark would be thinking about uh, for thinking about personal well-being, right? What people want uh, is maximal utility or preference satisfaction, which is uh, what they would ideally want if they were fully informed. So, so we have this theoretical idea, of course. How do we measure like the up direction? What is it that people want? And a, an appealing idea is to measure 
um, to measure this with a survey question, maybe a single survey question, like how satisfied you are with your life. So people would give rankings of that question um, of, the, of their own lives and we could compare those. Um, so um, self-reported or subjective well-being questions we're all familiar with. Um, there are many uh, prominent advocates of this and um, the talk that uh, as I progress through the talk today, um, I'll have a lot of um, positive things to say about what we can do with questions like this, whether they're on their own or in combination. Um, so, so this is this is one idea. Um, and if it's the case that this is a good uh, welfare measure, right? Then kind of moving up in well-being, right? You're getting um, a higher level of satisfaction. Uh, the question that um, my co-authors asked. Uh, with uh, Alex Reese Jones in a, a paper on back in 2012, uh, is looking at whether uh, it is the case that um, that people are maximizing as if to or act, acting as choosing as if to maximize um, satisfaction, how satisfied they are with their lives, and uh, so they asked people trade-off questions uh, where they are thinking about other dimensions of well-being, like the happiness of your family or uh, so your sense of purpose, your prestige, social status, and and what that what they what they found the evidence showed is that people seem to be willing to trade off um, uh, satisfaction or self reported satisfaction for other um, other dimensions of well being. So um, so this is kind of the fundamental starting point for thinking about an index. So if if there's not just one thing that people are saying they would always um, choose and that that's this that's what would make them happiest then um, then maybe we need to measure other things uh, one one possibility though is that um, maybe something like life satisfaction is already an aggregator right maybe it's maybe it's the survey question that aggregates other goods so we've got happiness of your family and other goods and uh, and, and so, so maybe the satisfaction is itself the the index in a sense. Um, in another uh, paper with Alex Reese Jones, where uh, the the team uh, asked people about um, re medical residencies and asked about the different features of those residencies, so kind of a real stake setting where they could elicit um, the trade offs people were willing to make between different dimensions. Um, of their expected kind of future future life with these different residency situations, and they find that um, that the the weights that are implied by maximizing um, how how satisfied they are, the life satisfaction measure, are different than um, the relative prices or weights that are implied by by choice. Um, sometimes off by as much as uh, sixty percent. So uh, so there is. So there's evidence that um, that this index approach could be promising, and instead of um, just asking one question, we can ask many questions. So, uh, so, uh, so with uh, Jakina Dubnam Guzman and Mark Fleur Bay, um, Dan and Miles and, and Ori have um, actually another paper on this, which is um, which asks people to, to probe more. What they're thinking about when they an answer some of the the um, standard subjective well-being questions. Oh, sorry, the sound is not good. Um, and and there there seems to continue to be evidence that there's no one measure that's fully capturing the the normative idea of what economists would like to would like to measure. So, um, so so going back to uh, to to paper with Nicole Zembrot, um, the theory is that uh, let's let's not have a single question, but think about utility as a function of many different aspects of well-being. So something like life satisfaction is um, a, a dimension, maybe a very important dimension, um, but other things matter too, including um, feelings, uh, you know, emotions of happiness or of um, experiencing sense of purpose, of supporting your family, your family's happiness. Um, it's just kind of a, a very open-ended list. So, uh, so this is this is the the idea for an index is to um, to move away from one measure that can do it all. Um, this also brings a counterpart to GDP, which is 
um, an index and which has a welfare interpretation for standard consumption goods. So if you're thinking about one individual's consumption, um, where these are market goods, so the, the C's would be market goods, then uh, in, the, um, in the measurement, the change in utility um, is approximated by uh, the change in the index where uh, the um, the, so the M's are the goods and the, the, the delta U, um, delta C, these are the changes um, in utility, the marginal utilities. So, so how much better off the person is by consuming a little more of these goods is um, proportional to the prices. Um, so, that's, so that's the basic theory of an index is to have um, the consumption changing over time. Um, so the C would be the consumption, um, the prices are measured, um, the prices would be uh, held fixed. And then as consumption is changing, changes in the index are um, approximately proportional to the change in utility. So this is, um, so this is the theory for market goods. Um, the BHKS paper um, proposes to go beyond market goods, right beyond just consumer goods to the personal well-being index. So those aspects of well-being are now the vector um, that goes into utility. And it's the same theory. We're thinking about a change in utility as being approximated by um, the sum of these um, changes in the dimensions weighted by their marginal utilities and, and the index, um, ha we hold fixed the marginal utilities um, and, and use the, um, the Ws to track um, changes in utility over time. So, uh, so small changes in those aspect levels are approximately proportional to the change in utility. So, um, so this is this is the basic theory of the personal well-being index. The two kinds of survey questions that we need then are not just the, the SWB question. So we still want to measure self-reported well-being, the little Ws. Um, we also want to have stated preference survey questions. So to estimate marginal utilities, um, which is to learn about how how valuable the goods are relative to each other. So uh, so we need to get to some examples here. Um, so, uh, so in our surveys, we've been uh, been asking um, some self-reported well-being questions like this. Um, so, this is an example for for life satisfaction. Thinking about the past year, how would you rate how satisfied you are with your life, uh, from the lowest level possible um, to the highest level possible, and then you move the slider to set your rating. And uh, this is uh, meant to approximate a continuous scale. So, there's been uh, of course, a lot of concerns about what we can infer about kind of a latent well-being variable if all we have is ordinal um, data with just a few response options. So by having more response options, uh, we're trying to increase the, uh, the, the critique of Bond and Lang. Um, and uh, the lowest level possible and highest level possible, those options are uh, intended to, to reduce top, top and bottom coding to really um, uh, to, to make sure that we, uh, yeah, min minimize those. And um, thinking about the past year, we're, we're trying to get everyone um, to explicitly think about the same, same time period. So, um, so this is an SWB question. The state of preference survey questions, I'm not going to talk, talk um, much more about in the talk, although I guess we could talk about them in the, um, the Q&A. But this is um, a choice between um, option one. This is a choice between an increase of health um, of four points and an increase of financial security of, of five points. So, uh, so the numbers for the starting points, so the 36 and the 60, those are the ratings that the, the person has done uh, earlier in their SWB questions. And then we're asking them to think locally about small changes. So this, um, this data will be used to estimate the marginal utilities. So, uh, so this is a stated preference question. Uh, today's, today's talk in the, in the, in the, uh, the remaining time here, um, about half, half the time, I wanna share with you what we've been um, doing um, on another challenge, which is um, getting interpersonally comparable quantities. So, so thinking back to those SWB questions, we certainly want to be able to infer that people have comparable levels of satisfaction, right? If they're giving similar similar ratings, 
um, that would be ideal. And um, stepping back from just our um, approach or the idea of having an index, um, there's there's a huge literature using self-reported well-being data. So, um, so whether it's the uh, the UK four um, right the four measures of um, of well-being, or it's um, other surveys where um, life satisfaction is tracked. Um, there's there's this huge literature, and much of this literature um, is explicitly or more often implicitly assuming that respondents are using the response scale in the same way. So, uh, so again, you know that if one person's rating a seventy and another's rating a seventy, then that's interpersonally comparable. Um, but there's a possibility that. Uh, someone's 70 is uh, is more like someone else's 80. And uh, if this is the case, this is um, potentially a, um, a major a major confound. So so we're gonna um, be thinking about the the, the ratings that people um, make as they are rating their their well-being um, as being um, some kind of re reporting function away from, um, their underlying well-being. So, so this is Andrew Oswald's paper um, that's cited there, and uh, the the idea is that people's people do have some underlying well-being um, that's inter interpersonally comparable. Um, otherwise, I think this the enterprise wouldn't have any hope. But then, um, but people as they're making their reports are are um, using the response scale differently. So, kind of. We're going to think about um, shift whether they shift using high numbers or or lower numbers, and and kind of how much of the scale that we're that they're using. Um, so this is uh, this is the focus for today. So um, the results that I'm going to share from a working paper, um, uh, and this is with Jian and Zhao, which we um, in which we are developing a methodology to adjust uh, for interpersonal differences in scale use, um, and the the pitch. Um, to the extent I'm making a pitch here, um, it would be that you would think about um, calibration questions, which is our approach um, to doing this adjustment and uh, the methodology that we're using in um, in the paper. Um, so even if we're not thinking about an index of well-being, if we have these self-reported well-being questions, um, calibration questions can help us think about whether people are using the response scale the same way and and adjusting if they're not. So, um, so this. This paper is related to a, a couple of dis, um, distinct literatures that haven't interact, uh, interacted too much. Um, so one of those is the anchoring vignette literature. So, uh, so for example, the paper um, Ari, Ari Kapsain uh, and co-authors is uh, looking at life satisfaction ratings and asking people to rate their own life satisfaction, but also asking people to rate, um, sorry, the audio is not good. Um, also asking people to rate their um, rate uh, vignettes. So uh, vin vignettes are descriptions of um, fictitious people's lives, um, and and they they see how people rate the vignettes and use that those to adjust people's um, self ratings. I don't. I'm trying to think if there's anything I can do to make the uh, make the sound better. Is it better when I'm closer to the uh, to the speaker? I'm so sorry about that. It does seem to be a bit better uh, when you you're closer. I haven't figured out a pattern yet. Other than that, that seems to work the best. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll keep I'll keep awkwardly leaning in. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um. So. Uh. Okay, so so anchoring vignettes. Um, this is um, this is origi originally proposed by, proposed by um, Gary King and co-authors um, from in the political science literature. So so vignettes have this um, background, and uh, uh, so so the idea is to um, to adjust ratings that way. Um, the vignette literature um, so far has been uh, been focused on skills that only have a few response options. So um, the, the reason being that they're that they're estimating these order, ordered probit models um, to try to um, place people's uh, ratings um, among the vignettes that they're rating. So for our um, zero to one hundred scale, it, um, it's, we would need uh, an extreme number of uh, vignettes to try to try to do that. 
Um, and uh, and this is the point I was making earlier that that um, that scale would um, require these untestable uh, distributional assumptions, right? Um, there's also another concern about the um, the the breadth of uh, a dimension of well-being, like like life satisfaction, so that um, if people are rating uh, vignettes about life satisfaction, um, the way that they're rating um, rating those might uh, might be be different depending on their own preferences. So if there's details about people's um, family status or employment, um, uh, field occupation, uh, that those would be um, correlated with with their own uh, with their with their own features and. Uh, so that it might not be uh, might not satisfy what the vignette literature calls uh, re response consistency. The idea that people should be rating the vignettes um, in, like they rate themselves and uh, vignette equivalence. The idea that the vignette should be the same for all people. So, um, so we're trying to make progress on that. Our approach is also related to um, a literature in um, psychology uh, on response styles. So. Um, so a uh, response response style is, seems uh, similar to what we call general scale use, which is this tendency that um, some respondents tend to respond the same way for any question asked on the same scale. Um, uh, for example, acquiescence response style on Likert scales is the phenomenon that some people just tend to say agree or strongly agree to, to everything. Um, so, uh, and disacquiescence response style saying disagree to everything. Uh, so, so, so this tendency is found. Um, this is studied in psychology and marketing. Um, there's there is a literature that studies where these response styles come from. So, uh, to the extent there um, that they're seen on on multiple survey occasions, uh, invariant to the person, of course. Um, we're in, we'd be interested, right? Why, why are there differences in response styles? Is it cultural personality? Um, but there does seem to be some um, uh, some some person specific response style. So our approach uh, is going to um, offer a theoretical framework and uh, statistical methodology that kind of bridges these two literatures and allows us to adjust for um, for e uh, either or dimensional scale use. So dimensional scale use is like the life satisfaction vignettes. So this would be correcting for um, for a SWB question with a calibration question that is in the same dimension. Um, so the advantage of that would be that it would capture all the all the relevant differences in how people rate that dimension. But because it requires that the that the calibration questions are in the same dimension, um, there could be problems with with that. Um, general scale use is the name for this general response style tendency that people only use um, or use use the scale the same way for all questions. Um, so we think that this captures um, a different part of scale use, which um, which would be seen across all questions. Um, so. What's nice about that is that we can use narrower questions to, to try to learn about that part of scale use, um, but it only captures part of scale use. So something that's uh, encouraging is that um, in our estimates, we're finding that about um, two thirds of the scale use heterogeneity um, can be attributed to general scale use in terms of the, the variation, how people are making their ratings. Um, and we do study vignettes, and the the general scale use part um, is even greater for vignettes. Okay, so without without further ado, um, let me tell you more about our data and these calibration questions that I've been talking about. So the data for the working paper come from Turk. We've got a large sample. Um, it's not representative, but um, but it's diverse, and uh, it's uh, three thousand three hundred fifty eight respondents um, from last year. So we've got um, uh, self-reported well-being questions in 33 dimensions. So, uh, so these are these are the dimensions here. I, the one that's in bold uh, is the overall well-being of you and your family. This is a um, an aspect of well-being or a dimension that um, 
uh, that the, uh, the forthcoming paper that I mentioned with uh, Mark Furbay and uh, Jakina is um, is advocating as perhaps a um, a good proxy, uh, maybe the the best we we found for um, for for idealized choice, and uh, we have a long a long list of aspects of well being here. So this, these are thir thirty three. The, the goal with this list is to try to cover the dimensions of well-being that other researchers um, and other and statistical agencies are are collecting data on, um, and also um, to cover some of the the emotional dimensions that Gallup collects data on. Um, and we also have a couple of of um, dimensions on here that we're going to use to uh to evaluate how well our scale use correction is doing so a kind of validation exercises um so your um your living environment not being spoiled by crime and violence is one of those and uh, the air in your area not polluted which is farther up it's alphabetically sorted um so uh so that's what we're looking at looking at here um we're not saying this is the perfect set of aspects of well-being um, we have some separate proposals for what would be in in the index um, that 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 we would estimate, but um, the choice of which aspects to include, um, I think, is going to be something that people continue to de debate for a long time. And different um, different groups or in different countries might have different different lists of aspects too. So um, so the the specific aspects are not at the moment our um, our focus, but these are the questions we have now. So we have these SWB questions. So we're asking people to rate thinking about the last year. How would you um, rate this aspect from zero to 100? And then we have these calibration questions. We have 18 calibration questions. Um, we call these CQs. Um, they're on the same scale from zero to 100, the lowest level possible to highest level possible. Um, so the first um, nine I'll say something about we call visual calibration questions. Uh, so this is. Uh, this is a calibration question. How dark is this circle? So the respondent moves the slider to make the rating. And uh, the calibration questions are presented in trios. So there's three of them stacked on a screen. So they, um, so they rate these questions and we have um, variation this way. Uh, um, we're trying to create variation in the underlying level of the thing that they're rating so that we can learn about how. Um, how they use this scale. Um, another trio of questions asks how curved is this line? So we have um, lines with different curviness and we have um, a fictitious continent here. Um, we ask how big by land area is this region, highlighting three different regions uh, in the continent. And people, so people rate these. Um, we also have um, nine vignettes. So these are gonna be calibration questions um, that ask people to rate um, scenarios in other people's lives. These correspond to three relatively narrow, um, kind of a nar as narrow and objective as, as we could get of, the, of SWB dimensions. So again, the questions are in trios. Um, we have three questions about your access to information um, and three about your ability to remember things. This is an example of uh, the vignette for, one of the vignettes for uh, your ability to remember things. And uh, so we give some sub dimensions of the um, of this of this dimension and uh, we have people rate these. Um, these are the the text for the other um, for the other two vignettes as well. So you can see there's um, there's a ranking. So uh, we wrote the vignette so that there's clear monotonic rating of the um, of, of the level of your ability to remember things in these scenarios. So, uh, so vignette three uh, being kind of the lowest level, vignette two being in the middle, and vignette one um, being the top one. So you've got your ability to remember things and your um, living environment not being spoiled by crime and violence. Uh, we find that the um, correlations between the SWB questions and uh, calibration questions are statistically significant. 
And, and this is our, our um, suggestive evidence for this, uh, for this general scale use phenomenon. So, um, so we've got the mean of the 33 SWB questions on the y-axis, the mean of the CQs on the, on the x-axis, and the correlation of 0.12. So this is just for those nine visual um, calibration questions. So um, not a huge correlation, but statistically significant. And the fact that, um, that people's darkness of circle ratings is, is correlated with their um, ratings of how happy they feel in those other dimensions is, is uh, we're getting used to the idea, but it's still it's still pretty surprising. Um, and these, this is a, a correlation of the standard deviation. So it's how high people rate things and also how spread out their ratings are that is correlated between the calibration questions and the SWB questions. If we look at the vignette calibration questions, uh, there's even stronger correlation. So 0.39, that's the 95% um, confidence interval there on the correlation. So, so these calibration question means are, are predictive of, um, or you know, correlated with these uh, SWB ratings. And then the strongest correlation of all is with the standard deviations uh, of the vignette ratings and the standard deviations of the SWB questions. So we're seeing how people, um, how much people use the scale. So scale use, uh, meaning, you know, when people see something low, how low do they go? When people see something high, how high do they go? It's very correlated with um, the range of their own aspects of well-being that they rate. Okay, so um, I'm, conscious, I'm conscious of the time. I just have a couple of results here. Um, and then I'm looking forward to, to hearing, uh, hearing your, your, your thoughts and, and, uh, and ideas. Um, so, um, so this is a regression uh, to show more of what's going on with the means and standard deviations of the calibration questions. Um, so, so the left-hand side variable is the mean or the standard deviation um, of, the of those 18 calibration questions. And we're regressing this on demographic variables. And the fact that um, there are these um, significant results, so the stars, um, the note, note says, these are significance with the false discovery rate thresholds of 0.05, including controls. So we do have some other control variables that are not shown here. Um, but the fact that these that there are statistically uh, significant from zero results is is telling us that 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 the the variation in calibration question ratings isn't isn't random. It's actually correlated with um, with demographics. Um, this isn't surprising given that the response style literature finds that um, that there are correlations with demographics of response styles. Um, for us. Um, this is this is not something we're probing deeply, right? Like, why do unemployed people statistically rate um, the mean lower and the standard deviation greater? Um, there's there's a lot to understand here, but the 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 core idea is that the fact that these are correlated, um, or um, yeah, the, the fact the correlated with demographics means that um, if we were to make comparisons across demographic groups of the raw ratings, we would um, we would have the skill use difference biasing our estimates. Uh, I'm going to uh, I, going to to not spend time on the um, the theoretical model. So so the theoretical model and econometric model um, are in the are in the paper. If people want want to read more about the um, the specific assumptions that we're making. Um, this is a, a, a nice graphic, um, but the idea is people are rating their own lives. This is the reporting function. Um, and then the calibration questions, the key uh, um, assumption is that what people are rating is the same state of the world. People are um, rating the same thing. So it's differences between the calibration question ratings that are going to allow us to identify um, the difference in how people, people rate things. So the tau there is what we call the translation function. So, so we're thinking about translating from person one's reporting function to person two's reporting function to learn about how the numbers mean different things to different people. Um, so one of the, one of the uh, help, helpful um, empirical regularities is that, um, is that the translation functions um, appear to be uh, appears to be linear. So we have um, some results. This is 
This is the translation function between groups. Um, so that the median income group on the X and the median income uh, above median income on the Y and the, um, the points here are the, um, are the means for the two groups. And we can see um, for the triples, the means um, fall on uh, nearly a, a straight line here um, and uh, not on the 45 degree line. So it's a, there's a, a positive relationship. So the different income groups are rating things the same. Um, in, you know, we have that monotonicity. Um, there are points off the identity, meaning that there is the scale, the scale use difference. Um, one of the key um, features uh, of our uh, statistical approach is going to be that we are that we're going to estimate differences in scale use that depend on the height of the calibration question. So by that we mean um, an SWB question. So that you can see that the that the translation function, the dark um, the dark line, is closer to the forty five degree line for high ratings um, as compared to lower ratings. So it's a line, but it's not um, parallel to the forty five degree line. So it depends on the height. Um, and there is a similar relationship across calibration questions. Um, and it's approximately linear. These are some other demographic splits um, showing that um, the way these different groups uh, make their ratings is different. Um, so we talked about linearity. Um, so this is our assumption about uh, response consistency. Uh, let me get to the statistical model here. So. All right, so our so our econometric model um, uh, is a linear um, a linear model. So the W is the um, the well being uh, that we don't observe. R is the report. Um, the alpha and the beta are going to be the skill use parameters. The gamma is a um, another skill use parameter, which is called the center. So it adjusts the the scale. Um, uh, to make the alpha and beta be uncorrelated. And then we've got a trembling hand error and a, a perception error. So um, accounting for differences in people's ratings that are not just from the scale use. So with some um, assumptions about um, the error terms, we can um, estimate uh, the uh, the moment dis moments of the distribution of the well well being variables. Um, so one of the features of uh, our, of this approach um, is that we are going to estimate the um, moments of well being. Um, estimating the translation functions at the um, individual level um, requires um, a huge amount of calibration questions. And um, for finite numbers of calibration questions is um, uh, is not uh, is not a good measure. So um, so we estimate the moments. So um, instead of estimating things at the individual level, we're estimating it um, for some group basically. So we have um, some results with the covariance of um, an SWB measure with the covariate, and that's the only uh, regression I have here. So I'll I'll, I'll end with this. So the um, the dependent uh, variable, or sorry, the sorry. So we have the unadjusted and the adjusted um, rating of life satisfaction, and um, the unadjusted version we have um, uh, results where income is positively related, age is uh, positively related. Um, unemployment negatively related. So these are um, kind of expected results. Um, the effect of skill use um, adjustment is uh, pretty modest. We um, see some changes, uh, but it's 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 not a, as a big a difference as what we see for no anxiety. So, so the life satisfaction mean um, is is greater than the mean for aspect of well-being, um, you're not feeling anxious. And it's, um, as we would predict, we get a bigger effect of skill use when we're doing the correction 
uh, for a aspect of well-being that has a lower mean. So, uh, so, so uh, life satisfaction has a mean of about 67. Um, no anxiety has a mean of 54. So, uh, so, so there's more um, adjustment happening for lower um, aspects of well-being. Um, so we're working on fielding the survey uh, or similar survey on the Understanding America survey on a representative sample um, and using our stated preference questions um, after we do the cal calibration question adjustment to aggregate to a well-being index. Um, one of the questions that we know um, we need to keep working on is identifying the best subsets of calibration questions. We hope that people will um, think about putting these in their surveys, um, but probably will not be able to answer uh, to ask 18 of them as we do. So, um, so we're working on subsets. Um, national index aggregation um, has to deal with some uh, other issues like um, multidimensionality um, and aggregating across people when there's inequality and aversion. Um, but um, our other hope is to con um, is to collaborate with um, others who are, are interested in doing um, well-being surveys um, to collect um, to collect more data. So if our framework um, could be flexible, I think that will be ideal that um, the dimensions of well-being could um, could differ by survey. We could have different lengths of calibration questions. And for the um, stated preference questions, we could potentially use estimates of the marginal utilities um, for the weights from um, from MTurk data or from uh, UAS data so that we don't necessarily have to keep asking the, um, the, the trade-off questions because that makes the survey longer too. Okay, so, so that's, that's the end. And I thank you so much, especially for bearing with me on the sound. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen, especially for making it through this uh, period with bad sound. So uh, I appreciate your uh, let's do that. Um, everyone, uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hands or to write in the chat uh, if you have a question. Uh, we, can, we have about 10 minutes, but we'll, we'll go a little longer if needed. Um, I, ho I hope it's okay if I help answering questions. Oh, oh there's Miles. Yeah, hi, hi Miles. Um, my, my first question, uh, just to get us started, is... Um, you know, if people are facing survey fatigue or, uh, you know, also framing, so you have the, the different questions of subject well-being, and I imagine that if you ask anxiety before, uh, say, an overall life evaluation question, you're going to get different results. So uh, what you've done to experiment with that and, and if you're seeing any form of fatigue uh, and how that might impact your results. Thanks. Uh, so, so the order of the SWB questions is randomized, and we've we've looked we've looked a bit at the question order um, effects. One one hypothesis we had was that um, the first rating that people make, whether they rate kind of a high or low dimension first, um, might matter and kind of set their scale use. Um, we also randomized whether people do the um, calibration questions first or the self or the SWB questions first. Um, we found a very limited effect of the, of that of what comes first of that question order effect. Um, to dive deeper into a specific question order, I think we would have limited data because there just would be wouldn't be many observations where we would have the same order. So we haven't looked at that. Um, specific, specifically, like um, comparing two questions, but um, it's it is a, it's a it's a very good question, and we know people will be probably um, thinking about the dimensions differently based on what they've answered. Um, and survey fatigue um, uh, is a yeah a good good question too. We do have some um, in in one of our longer surveys. We have some at attention. Check so we have a repeated um, question, so some repeated SWB questions, um, and um, so we're we think we think people are staying with us, but survey fatigue's yeah good. I mean a very valid concern. Okay, thanks, Tristan. So the next uh, I saw Joe Sergey raise his hand. 
And then Rex, I think you'll go afterwards. Uh, so Joe, you're up first. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, hi, Kristen. Um, hi. There is um, a question. The question is, you know, I was looking at those dimensions of of subjective well-being, you know, dealing with life satisfaction, and it looks like it's a, it's a sort of a comprehensive list. I'm just wondering, where did you get those dimensions? Uh, were they did they come from a body of work, um, an established theory, or where did the, where do these come from? Great question. Thank you. Um, thanks, Joe. So, um, so uh, so the paper with um, Nicole Sembra, um, um, Dan, and Orian Miles in uh, in 2014 had a list of 136 dimensions of well-being. Um, trying to be, yeah, as you were saying, comp comprehensive, drawing from um, from philosophy and psychology and um, every, every every kind of field of study to to um, to, to come up with that list. Um, we've we have pared back the list, but we're still um, re I think re relying on uh on others who have thought about the list so we tried to cover um so we have we have an aspect corresponding to each of the 10 um i think it's 10 the oecd the better life and in, um initiative in the indices um the new zealand um well-being framework has some uh has a set of questions that we tried to make sure we could cover their dimensions we have the ons4 to cover those so the idea was to, to start with questions that people were asking and and build up um so at this point not worrying um not worrying about the overlap but just trying to be co more comprehensive um well, so, so, so does that i i Kristen, this is mentioning your... that in addition to what we did in this data collection we uh uh Kristen and i spent some time uh writing writing a couple of thousand uh different SWB questions. So we have a bank of SWB questions that we've, uh, about 1800 that we've collected some data on, but, but this particular data collection had uh, the much smaller set Kristen was pointing at. 1800 is impressive. Um, so we have the, the next question from Rex Green, who's in the chat, and then we'll come back to the, the raised hands. So Rex asks, uh, will NIH, the National Institute of Health, be responsible for posting the index for actual use. Oh, um, uh, so it won't be NI. It won't be NIH. It'll be um, our responsibility. But yes, it's going to. Um, we'll put the data in our repository. Um, uh, I mean, this, uh, the mTORC data will be in a repository when we're when we're um, at a later phase of working with it ourselves. Um, in the UAS data, it's it's neat. They have. Um, uh, they have very easy to access data. Um, the Understanding America survey um, from the Center for Economic and Social Research, it's our um, RE Captain's survey at USC. Um, so that survey data, so it will be under an embargo at the beginning, but then it will be available. And they have a really nice code book and people will be able to use that. And the UAS has a lot of, um, it's, so it's a, an ongoing panel. So there's just a lot of rich data about the yeah. individuals in that in that panel, um, and we do hope people will use it. Yeah, thanks. Great, uh, Paul Anand, you were next. Hi, thanks, thanks, Kristen. Uh, that's a lovely paper. I'm sure it's going to be very important. Um, one of the um, concerns or or issues that does come to mind, though is that I wonder if when one's trying to build an index on the basis of subjective well-being type questions, whether really the biggest question of all is uh, what to do about adaptation. Uh, and so um, the idea, I suppose, is that people have their own internal um, level of of well-being or happiness and they the actual responses that you observe are um deviations from that through you know shocks to which they have not completely adapted as yet and maybe they'll take 
there might be some things. I think Andrew's probably done some, uh, got a good paper on adaptation and some things to which uh, people adapt quite quickly and some things to which, which take maybe, you know, several years to adapt to. And so I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering how we should yeah. think about this. If you've, if you've given that any, any so, so this is, at all. Thank this you. is something. Miles wants, yeah, go ahead, Miles. Okay, yeah. if, I, if I could answer this. So, so this is something I personally have been very interested in and, and it's a hard problem. So, so I have a, I have a paper with um, a, about adaptation using the health and retirement study data. So what we, um, uh, with, with uh, Ryan Nunn and Dan Silverman and, and there uh, we were looking at the details. We find exponential decay. We find that if you're, that this is people over 50, but if your spouse dies that people, it's about nine months worth. Uh, and if your child dies, it's about two years worth, not quite as intense. So there are a lot of details there. I think it's, I think it's a difficult, I think it's a difficult problem, but one that I'm, you know, I'm intensely interested in. We, we do plan, we, we'd love to hear more of your thoughts about this because we plan to have working on hedonic adaptation be some part of the, the grant that we're currently writing, some of the things that we're proposing. And, but that's, that's one of the th places that we're really very open to suggestions about what should be done. We're, we're, we know we want to do something on hedonic adaptation. We got to we got to make it very specific, but it's not yet very specific. Well, I'm happy to have a conversation with you afterwards. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Beyond just actual adaptation to individual events, you have habituation. You just mentioned the hedonic uh, adaptation. So you mentioned one of the scales. You have anchors which are the highest level or the lowest level. And we know that the highest and lowest can change over time as our experiences have changed and our reference points change. You have the cancer ladder with the best possible life, worst possible life. And you can ask some questions about what's included in that for them, uh, what the best possible life is, what they're thinking of in that anchor. Um, you know, Mark Fabian has some questions, right? Uh, uh, getting at what people are thinking about when answering these questions. And it's harking back to uh, some, in some cases, the Cantrell 1965 book, uh, what characterizes the best possible life. Although that's gonna be done in a more qualitative way than quantitative, uh, to, to my knowledge, although Mark can chime in and say what, uh, more there. Uh, I also, I neglected Sama. Sama was next in the, in the question. Although if you want to respond to you're, you're welcome to, of course. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, and um, I've often been very suspect of vignettes and your vignettes were the most convincing I've seen so far. So, so that's great. Um, I'm wondering, um, if there's a possibility, you've talked about sort of having a reduced set of questions for calibration. I'm wondering, is there any possibility, obviously it won't be as accurate, but is there any possibility of using, um, you found relationships between demographics and the calibration, the, the, the calibration questions. Is there any way to use data from other surveys for the calibration so that you don't have to ask the calibration questions in every survey? Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. Let, let me address this first of all, you, we, we've done a lot of simulations where you just have two calibration questions or three. And, and if, if you have a large sam sample, large number of respondents, that's going to work fine. You don't need a huge number of calibration questions if you have a huge sample of people. And, and I think exactly what you're saying can work across surveys. Now, obviously, we wouldn't recommend that using MTurk, but with the, the UAS is going to be much more representative and, and the, the predictions from the demographic predictions from there will be things that you can, you can use in, in correcting other surveys. One of, one of the things that we're going to do is, uh, we plan to do in the coming calendar, you, you know, in 2024 is look at translations across, uh, survey response options. So, 
So the, 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 our zero to 100 possible frame, how that compares to the other ones that are in other data sets. So we should be able to, we should be soon in a much better uh, situation to translate the results we get from our zero to 100 scale to the corresponding results in the data set that, that you might be using. All right, thank you. Uh, Johnson, did you want to ask your question or shall I read it out for you? Yeah, okay, I can, I can read it. Yeah, okay. So he first off says, thank you. Um, and then asks, uh, do you ask the stated preference question for all dimensions or indicators? Don't you think it can happen that after computing the marginal rates of substitution for all the dimensions that you can find important dimensions exhibiting an overlap? Uh, what would you do in such a situation, uh, for instance, <laughs> having uh, okay. high marginal rates of substitution or education? That, that, that's one of the big things. I said that the hedonic adaptation was not super specific in the yet in the grant we're writing, but what we're going to do about overlap actually is. And, and it's actually quite a complex answer, but we have the the basic idea is to, is to use factor analysis. However, factor analysis, some people think factor analysis solves the problem uh, by itself, but it doesn't. So uh, if, if there were only one big factor, then factor analysis would be enough, enough perhaps, if you're really lucky. But the, 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 there is one big factor, but it's only about 45% of the variance. So the lesser fa lesser factors do matter. And you need to know, in effect, the relative prices of the different factors. So let me kind of leave it at that, that we're, we're, what we've done so far has been kind of the relative prices or the marginal rates of substitution between different you know, individual aspects of well-being. We're going to try to do marginal rates of substitution between the different factors that come out of the factor analysis of, of the well-being rate. Johnson, did you get all that? There was some uh, sound challenges again. Uh, I managed to pick something, but uh, at some point I, I lost him because uh, the, I think the, the microphones are not very uh, good. Oh, so, oh, sorry. Maybe I was too... <laughs> I can get closer. Anyway, we're, we'll, we'll use factor, and the idea is to use factor analysis and to get relative prices of factors. And we're, we're but we're going to use um, fairly rather than just abstract, you know, what if this aspect of well being goes up by this much? We'll use, uh, we'll use stories. And it'll, in, in a way, it's a little bit like vignettes, but vignettes where you're asking people to make choices between two different things that are described in words and have them rate how they would, which they would choose and how they think they'd affect a set of aspects and that set of aspects that they tell you how they affect, we're then gonna in effect uh, with, with maximum likelihood impute what's going on with the, under, with the uh, factors from the factor analysis. So that's the basic idea. Okay, thanks Miles. So uh, we can stay an extra minute or two if anyone has another question. And I, I think I might ask one uh, clarifying, you know, maybe probing question. Have you guys done any uh, calculations of aggregates after adjusting? And because you show the adjusted and unadjusted regressions, and they're adjusting for demographic characteristics, which is correlated with uh, calibration questions. And so I imagine that you would get a larger difference between aggregates that are adjusted and unadjusted. But to come up with uh, an adjusted aggregate is not straightforward. Um, and and or how do you compare it? So it, it's not clear to me how to do what I'm asking. So I'm wondering if you guys have already thought about it. And what do you mean by an aggregate? So, I mean. Like a mean across aspects. Or, a, or the index itself, like the weighted combination. Because the, okay, with our, with one of the more basic ways of correcting for scale use, the only thing that matters is the height. And so if you know, if you know the overall mean of the, 
mean across aspects, sort of the global mean, then you know how you do the scale use correction and it's just going to be in between what the correction is for the higher aspect and the lower aspect. And it, with, with fancier corrections, you can just correct each individual aspect before, before getting a, a linear combination of the aspects. I mean, so it's, 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 it's the, the theory is really no, no different. Or you have to, you have to choose a baseline. So someone has, let's say on the calibration questions, let's say the uh, objective darkness of the uh, color of the circle. Right. Yeah. And so that would be your baseline and we adjust everyone to that. Um, that would make sense, uh, possibly, uh, alternatively, it could be done in a different way. Um, and then. Right now, I don't think you have enough data. You need some uh, comparison to to do this with, and so I think this might have to be done later or across some um, I, form of, of I think aggregate. This is a pretty long discussion. Yeah, so, so let me just say, in terms of the statistical techniques for adjusting to scale use, this literally took us years to figure it out, and and so it's it's hard. Enough. I mean. Hopefully, some of it is easy to explain, but it's not all easy to. Uh, okay. The, the, the more difficult methods take a, take a little more time to explain. Okay, that, that that works for me. And also, Johnson had let's say uh, the last question, so we'll let you go, Johnson. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kelsey. Uh, in regards to the discussion about aggregation, uh, I noticed that in the presentation you had something like equivalence approach. But in this uh, short discussion that we've had, uh, I see that you mentioned a lot of average, mean, but I didn't hear anything about distribution. Christopher and I are advocates about for distribution as opposed to just looking at averages and means. Uh, I don't know whether this is something- I mean, we did about. look at that. It was mainly a limitation of time. So in fact, scale use correction, along with just simply accounting for, res for response error makes a huge difference to the variances. So basically variances are over, overestimated by a factor of 2.5. And, and you know, actually a, a lot of that's just ordinary response here, but, but a significant chunk of it is, is scale use heterogeneity. And so the, the adjustments for the variance are much bigger uh, than, than they are for happiness regressions. So absolutely, we're very interested in the distribution. And, and in fact, for a national well-being index, if, if you want to deal with inequality, you're going to have to look study the whole distribution. Great. Uh, thanks. That makes sense. Uh, I should uh, just give one, two last points. So uh, Mark Fabian responded to an earlier point saying, they do have a range of methods for adjusting for, and this was in relation to the habituation or the adaptation. Uh, first is qualitative, and then they progressively get more uh, quantitative and longitudinal. And then you had a couple of thank yous uh, in the chat, uh, and you can see them there. Thanks. Uh, I'll take that opportunity to say thank you very much, uh, Miles or Kristen. If you have any last uh, burning points, uh, we'll, we can take them now. Well, that's great. And, and we really would, it sounds like we should get together with both Paul and Mark to talk about hedonic adaptation. Possibly so. Mark says yes. Thank you, Johnson. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. And thanks, Kelsey. Yep, have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, yeah.